Hello, hello. How are you guys? I know it's Friday night and I was going to go live on the page, but I decided to come live here to get a bigger audience because I think this is a key topic that teachers suck. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You guys want to hear me out? You're going to be surprised at the topic. Okay. So, my name is Raven Woods. I'm the CEO and founder of Autism Mama Rocks IEP, and I help parents gain the knowledge and the confidence to become the CEO of their IEP meeting. And I just recently got out of an IEP meeting, and so, as you guys know, I always learn something at IEP meetings. And you guys want to share this, so share, 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 share. Um, this topic is not what you think. Um, so... If you are new to Catching Me Live, post a one below. One below. Catching the replay, one below. If it's your first through third time, okay? Post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie. You guys still need to do that, okay? You got to post a two below. I want to know um, because so many people post and then I'm so busy running my mouth. I don't see everything, okay? Um, so we're going to talk about this for a second because I had a really good IEP and I want to tell you about it. All right. And then look at this. I wrote everybody's name down that I got to call when I get out of here. Look, I got to call like 14 people. <laughs> I don't want to put it up long because I had their phone numbers, but I'm like, these are, uh, and this is at the end of the week. I could not call them because I was so busy in IEPs all week. And now I got to call like 14 of these people that like I promised I would call. So with that, said hello everybody Pamela and Cynthia and Dorothy and Dawn and Michelle hey Michelle um hey Carrie how are you you are next on my list right after this live I will be on the phone with you um hey Tara and Dawn I said hi to Dawn hi Dawn <laughs> and Dorothy okay so we're gonna get started on this topic I know it sounds pretty harsh right oh my god am I really gonna talk about how teachers suck no I'm not okay so I'm going to tell you, um, I actually am proud of myself today because this meeting went really well. And then I had to explain to the parent, which I really enjoyed doing, um, and telling her, add me to your list to call. Okay. Um, so I enjoyed explaining everything to her after the IEP and explaining how it was a win. Okay. So let me explain this to you. Hi, how are you, Marlene? Hey, Christina, how are you? And Dorothy, uh, make sure you guys share this. Hey, Lori, uh, make sure you share this. Okay, that's number one. Number two, okay, post a one below if it's your first through third time catching me live. Post a three below if you're an oldie but goodie. And I'm telling you guys, I keep telling you to share. I'm doing a Black Friday deal and y'all aren't sharing. But if you are, I'm not seeing it because I don't see share on there. So, you know, it's up to you. Okay. Hi, Kim. How are you? Okay. I'm just playing with you guys. Do whatever you want. Um, and if you haven't joined the group, just put in the search Autism Mama Rocks IEP group. The group is actually growing more than this page, guys. Believe it or not. Okay. So there's going to be a time where I'm just going pretty much live in the group. Okay. That's where the Q&A is done too. Um, thank you. I'm not liking my haircut. It's a new haircut. I love the color, the new color, but I'm not dig in the new haircut but I'm you know I'm 43 guys so I don't really dwell on that stuff because guess what Jessica are you on my call oh I thought you were on my car call list Jessica but you're not okay so I'm not digging the haircut like it's bugging me because she did like straight across in the back and then like I, I don't know but thank you I appreciate it um but, you know, it'll grow out. I'm 43, so I don't really care. I, I more care about the color, and I love the color. So the cut will grow out. All right, so here's the deal. Um, I had an IEP meeting today. Thank you, Michelle, um, for sharing. Um, uh, I like that cut, my professional opinion. Okay, thank you. Are you a hairstylist? Um, okay, so here's the deal, y'all. I had an IEP meeting, all right? And it was for a mom, and she knows this. She was a worry wart, okay? And she 
had so many questions and so many, thank you, me too, I like the color, um, so many concerns. And, you know, I told her, I was finally, I finally told her, I said, you know, oh my God, just relax, okay? I got this. You know, we've talked multiple times, you know, and, you know, she'd send me her concerns and she'd, you know, she'd send me her concerns again and she'd send me her concerns again. And she did my whole IEP package. I'm the one who's dealt with all her emails to the team and setting up the IEP that was today and, you know, so on and so forth. All right. So um, her child, okay, he's actually, the academics isn't so much the issue, okay? Um, a little bit, but not a lot, okay? It's more so behavior, all right? So behavior and safety, okay? Picking up paper clips and putting them in his mouth, putting staples in his mouth, right, from the floor in the classroom, um, you know, virtually running around, um, breaking pencils and putting that um, silver part in his mouth, um, and, you know, just not on it at all, okay? In the classroom, hitting other kids, um, you know, running around, being, you know, disruptive. Um, it goes on and on and on with behavior, okay? Across the board and the FBA that we went over today, it was straight up, you know, doesn't stay on task, you know, off course, you know, um, his behaviors are impeding his learning, um, disruptive of other students, um, you know, it just goes on and on, all right? And mom, you know, at home is way past frustrated. So that's where all her questions and her concerns and her, you know, just ongoing, just insistence of, you know, trusting me, you know, that's number one. And then number two, you know, getting a grasp of how the process works, okay? And, you know, so in the IEP meeting, and I'm getting there in regards to the teacher. I know you guys want to hear this part. Um, and in regards to the behavior, it was across the board. Let me grab this paperwork. All right. So I'm going to tell you all the things I wrote down as you saw my chest, like, right in the camera. So sorry about that. Um, okay. So here we go. So I wrote all my notes down. And so we're talking about, you know, when I listen to everybody in the IEP meeting, typically I take notes and my, my thought process is always going to plan of action, plan of action, plan of action. What do I suggest? What do I want, you know, for the student? All right. So that's where my mind goes. And so in this child's um, records, you know, he was touching others, he couldn't stand in line, sporadic behavior, pu pushing, shoving, kicking, hitting, you know, the safety concerns that I just told you about, you know, putting staples and, you know, everything else in his mouth and the silver part of the pencil and breaking pencils and, you know, it's, it was, it's a mess, you know, something is not working virtually and in school because this is actually documented from school. We actually today finally went over the evaluations that were done in February of 2020, okay? And so this student, um, you know, I started the meeting and it, was, it wasn't contentious like it can be in my IEP meetings in the beginning because I'm setting the tone. I'm letting them know I'm, I'm, I'm running this show um, in the beginning, which is addressing the parents' concerns, all right? And then I'm open to listening and discussing and so on and so forth, or it's discussing in the beginning parents' concerns and requesting evaluations, so then we'll go at it with that sometimes. But this one did not go like that. You know, they got a little bit defensive on the fact that I immediately, because we jumped into the BIP, and immediately started talking about the parents' concerns, which is why we jumped into the BIP and the FBA that was done, really, and then the BIP suggestions. And um, it was interesting because I had a lot of critiques. I, I am not a BCBA, but I have an extensive amount of knowledge in um, how a BIP is written. Um, I have an extensive amount of knowledge on what should be put into a BIP, not just because my daughter's 15 and she's had a BIP since she was four. And, you know, but then I also at, went to the University of West Florida for a year um, and two months out of the two years to get my BCBA, and then I quit <laughs> because it wasn't my thing. Um, waste of money, but it wasn't my thing, so I was like, I might as well cut it off where I'm at, but, you know, 
it, it was what it was. So I have an extensive amount of knowledge and, you know, I've worked with kids and then of course, you know, with my own child, you know, um, having self-inflicting behaviors and behavior being an issue and so on and so forth. And every situation is different, but in all honesty, the scenario is the same, meaning the scenario as in each child, okay, whatever their behavior is, a behavior stems from something, okay? Either a child is trying to tell you something, they can't control it for some way, shape, or form. It is within their being of who they are and what their disability is, and they can't control it. Sometimes, though, they can Okay, sometimes there's behaviors that are just stemming from them. Skylar's actually told me this. Mom, I'm just so frustrated. My body's tight. You know, she'll tell me certain things that I'm like, ah, oh, that's I, I felt that way before her, you know. So, um, you know, it's important to understand that behaviors come from somewhere. I don't care where it is, but it's coming from somewhere. So our job and what a lot of people fail like to do is to process the fact that we need to figure out where the hell that behavior is coming from. All right. And that's hard to do sometimes, you know, like, like I said, we're not all BCBAs or experts or whatever the case may be. But, you know, the point is, is we've got to find out whether that be, okay, sorry, I'm trying not to have my fan and light, you know, in your face. Okay. So the point is, is I, my job, okay, is to figure out the solution. All right, we need to get this IEP in order. We need to get it written right. We need to get it on, what do I say, on check and ready to go. All right, so, um, you know, the first thing that I saw was a lot of what was in the BIP were accommodations that should have already been in the IEP. Not all of them were, some were. Um, but they don't technically always go in a BIP, but they can, but then additional things need to go in the BIP as well. So, for example, they had movement, they had chunking, they had extra um, direction, they had no homework. You know, there's just different things. Hi, how are you? Um, okay, awesome. So make sure you post a one below, Crystal, because you're new. It's a one below if it's your first through third time, two below if you're an oldie but goodie. So welcome. All right. So he had, um, we, he had desk organization system, okay, and he had um, ignore certain behaviors, and then these are things that I suggested, but some of them were already in the BIP. And then another thing I suggested was positive attention for positive behavior. So, you know, in a BIP, it's antecedent behavior consequence. So a lot of people think, okay, there's what happens before the behavior. Then it's, okay, well, the behavior happens. And then, okay, the consequence. No, it's antecedent, which is what happens before the behavior happens. What's stemming or causing the behavior? All right. So that means your butt may need to go back up to the school and figure out how you need to be in that classroom for a split second with a mask or not a mask or whatever, because you need to figure out what the heck's going on in that classroom if there's behaviors happening and they're unable to tell you what the heck it's from because, you know, it really doesn't take a whole lot to figure that out. But for some reason, people seem to, you know, stall. Um, so figure out where the behavior comes from. And that doesn't mean that you just observe one time. Sometimes you have to observe a couple times, you know, think about at home. There's behaviors that happen at home. It's not just one place. We all know that, right? Just not just like it's not in vir just vir virtual. It's at school. Just like school can't say, oh, it doesn't happen here ever, but it happens at home all the time. Bullshit. Come on now, people. Um, so bottom line, all right, we need to figure out where the behavior is coming from. What is it caused from? It could be attention-seeking behavior. It could be as simple as that, attention-seeking behavior. All right, you know what? You're not giving me positive attention, so shoot, if I be bad, you're going to give me attention then. I used to do that, and I didn't have a um, VIP or special ed or anything like that. Shoot, I knew as a little girl that if I was bad, mom was giving me attention. It was as simple as that. So really, and I'm not saying that's what your child's issue is. I'm just saying that, you know what I mean? There's always a reason. There always is a reason. And that reason could be it's their disability and they cannot control what they're doing. But I don't say, hey, go after that one right away. I say, go and view what is happening, okay? And figure out, dissect what's happening and figure out what's stemming it. Stemming it meaning starting it, beginning it causing it, etc. Okay. And then think of what is it that I can do to stop that from happening? All right. 
There's always a way. Okay, does that mean that everything's going to be perfect? Absolutely not. But does that mean that you can create a plan of action in which to put in place that is consistent? Okay, that your child knows, hey, if I go and do self-inflicting behaviors, okay, I used to say that, you know, Skylar would hit her chest, so that's what she would do. Um, so instead of doing that, and I told you about her cussing, you know, and what we did with that, um, so, you know, she would do the self-inflicting behavior. So we taught her, you know, the BIP, you know, had in it that she would hit a pillow or and that pillow, that small square pillow was in the room with her. OK, so she was taught in the antecedent phase because the behavior was caused by frustration, her wanting to escape from doing the work, which is what this child's 99.99999% of the is, issue is, okay, is his issue is escape. His issue is I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and that's how it's going to be, all right? Hmm, sounds like a typical child, doesn't it? So that was his, that's his thing. I, you're not going to make me do work. I'm, I'm going to go under the desk. I'm going to run around. I'm going to jump on the bed. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And that's what's happening at home. At school, it was hitting other children. It was running around the classroom. It was not standing in line. It was, you know, being disrupted in every way, shape, or form. You know what I mean? So bottom line, we have to figure out in what situation and what scenario and what place they're doing what behavior, what's causing it, and move from there. So the antecedent is where that happens. So this child, we're taking him virtually right now because, you know, even though he was physical and all those things, you know, at school, we're just going to talk about virtual right now. All right. So bottom line, hi. Um, so bottom line, my thought process immediately went to and reviewing all of his data, all right, was one, attention-seeking behavior. 100% was happening. Number two, okay, escape. He didn't want to work. He don't want to do it, especially because the behaviors increased with writing. So he doesn't like to write. So, okay, so we have a child that's acting out, doing things that are safe, not safe, and behaviorally because he doesn't like to write, and that's when the behavior goes up, all right? He has behaviors, but they spike at the writing phase and the writing time during virtual school. All right. And this is just a small example of virtual. OK, like I said, he's physical in school and he does other things. All right. But this is just an example of teaching you the things that you need to start thinking about to dissect this. All right. So make sure to share this, guys. All right. A lot of kids have behavior issues and this could really help people. All right. So the first thing I did was I wrote everything down. I wrote down touching others in school, standing in lines, sporadic behavior, pushing, shoving, hitting, kicking, safety, all right? And then I wrote what he did at home, jumping on the bed, you know, pulling pencils out, breaking pencils, um, putting a crayon in his eye. Um, he was, he swallowed a staple, you know, he, um, he would talk to himself in school and virtual and making noises. Um, in class, when he was in class, he would just walk out of the class, you know. So, um, and all of this is stemmed from a lot of escape of behavior because he didn't want to do it. All right. So, my first issue is the BIP or the FBA that was done and then the BIP suggestions, all right, in this meeting. Um, they were more directed to accommodations like chunking, letting him get up and move around, um, you know, organization of his organization system in his desk and at home having an organizational binder and some sort of organization. Um, another one that they had put in was ignoring behaviors. Um, and I think that's all they put in. Oh, movement for breaks. Um, and that was it. Okay. And this is a student who um, also, and I'm going to tell you about a violation we figured out too. I'm going to tell you about that. Um, his mom, you know, is just beside herself in frustration. All right. And many of us are like that. Um, and then, you know, so, okay. So my mind went here. First, in the BIP, I get the accommodations. Awesome. I'm glad you put them in there. I don't care where you put them in there. Just put them in there because they're going to go in the IEP anyway. So I don't really give a crap where you put the accommodations in the BIP. What I want to see in that BIP is what is the behavior? 
and you better label every single behavior. And if another behavior pops up, enter it into the BIP with an amendment. All right. So if he has 10 behaviors, typically I don't have 50, 60 behaviors. So if he has 10 behaviors, all 10 better be in that BIP. If he gains an 11th behavior, that better go in the BIP too. And there has to be a plan of action for each behavior. Can there be similar plans of actions for different behaviors? Sure, but they have to work. And if they don't work, then it's one of those things that it's a puzzle and you figure out what works. You play with it and figure it out, all right? And that doesn't mean you 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 wait three months to figure it out. No, if it, you're going to figure out really quick if it's working or not, all right? And, you know, if it's working or if it's improving, then maybe do it a little longer and then see. So my first issue was we need to create a proper BIP, all right? The BIP needs to be proper, all right? And that's what I wrote. Oops, you can even see. First thing I wrote. Can you see? Yeah, proper BIP. That was my first thing. And then my second thing is what? Look, these are my notes. Proper accommodations, all right? So my first thing is you have to have a proper BIP. Your proper BIP is just like your IEP. They got to be in check. All right, because you can write an IEP and you can write a BIP, but if they don't mean squat, they don't mean squat and they ain't going to do squat. Okay, so a proper BIP has a de-escalation plan for every single behavior. All right, if the child goes and hits another student, what is the de-escalation plan? Because he's obviously escalated in some way if he's going to walk over and hit another student. There, there's an escalation somewhere. There's a sensory problem somewhere. Something is going on within that child that is having them go over and hit the child. All right, people just like, you know, gen ed students, if they're going to go punch someone out, there's a reason for it. Typically, they just don't walk over to somebody and punch them out. You know, think about high school fights. Something stemmed that fight. Behavior's the same across the board, guys. Okay, so and as moms, we're not experts as this. All right. So as a teacher and as other teachers and, you know, other people who have more expertise, you know, like the psychologists and the BCBAs and so forth, we all know behavior is behavior. It doesn't matter if they're special needs or, or gen ed. Did you know that? The only difference is one has a BIP, hopefully, and one doesn't. All right. Because behaviors stem from the same thing. Other than with children with special needs, their behaviors can stem from the inability to understand how to appropriately let things go or inappropriately handle things and have sporadic behaviors in which they cannot control. So there's the difference, you know, where if a high schooler, he's pissed off that someone kissed his girlfriend, you know, then he's going to go punch that he goes and punches the guy out. Well, what stemmed that behavior, the jealousy or whatever happened, right? But that that high schooler typically knows, okay, I shouldn't be punching him out, but I'm gonna punch him out anyway, because he kissed my girlfriend, right? So the same thought process can go through a child with special needs head, believe it or not, because not all special needs children's behaviors stem from the inability to understand that behavior, all right? Some don't understand behavior. Some can't control, have uncontrollable movements and things that they can't control, and some do. And the ones that do, all right, there's a reason on both ends of why they do what they do. One's uncontrollable and something set them off, all right? Like this student was escape and he didn't want to do his work and whatever. I remember as a kid, I didn't want to do my work and I would act like an ass, you know? So it's it, you got to look at the fact that, hey, some things these children with special needs are doing is a lot like typical children as well, okay? We just handle it a little bit differently, all right? So if your child is physical, all right, we need to figure out why that child needs to be physical, okay? Thank you, Dorothy. Um, so a child's need to be physical, there's a reason for that, especially if they're a younger child and they're physical, okay? There's just not something that pops in their brain that just says, hey, I want to punch people out today, you know? So there's something that's stemming that ca that's causing serious frustration within them. And that frustration may not come from any one person. It could come from what's going ar around them right now, all right, in their, in their circumstances, in where are they at, okay, in the school, in the home, and whatever, all right? So if they're at home and they are, you know, or let's just say they're at school, okay? So say they're at school and the fire drill goes off, all right? I can tell you hands down, that'll set all kinds of children off. 
all right? So I know in, in a BIP, it is put, well, number one, if the fire drill goes off, all right, then these are the, the steps that we put to have a de-escalation plan that, you know, it, but I'll tell you what I do instead. But bottom line, I say, okay, then what we're going to do first off is we're going to take that child to a sensory-based room. So usually a lot of good, good sensory-based rooms are dim. They have like um, those beanbag chairs. They have a lot of manipulatives. It's a very calm room, um, a good sensory room in a school. They have multiple of them, many of them, so that they can only have a few kids at one time in one room or sometimes one. Um, and so that child needs a de-escalation plan of peace and quiet and sh all right. And because they couldn't handle all that noise and commotion and kids going outside and, you know, so, okay, so we can have that de-escalation plan in place, but you know what? Let's solve that damn problem altogether. All right. So solving that problem altogether is that child needs to be taken out of the school before that alarm goes off. Okay. So the, that's kind of the way you got to think about things with behavior. Let's eliminate the behavior. Let's not just put something in place if the behavior happens. Let's eliminate the behavior altogether. So if we need to take that child outside or wherever we got to take them, let them go swing on the swing outside or whatnot, then that's what we do because we don't want to set them off. We don't want them to have self-inflicting behaviors. We don't want them hitting other children. We don't want their behavior impeding their education, home or school. Okay. So another thing, um, other than a proper BIP in place and a proper de-escalation plan in place for every single one of those behaviors, okay? So the next thing is proper accommodations in place. And those of you who don't know what a de-escalation plan is, that's a step-by-step -step of what's going to happen if a behavior happens, okay? That's not an antecedent point. That's at the behavior point. All right, antecedent point is what do I got to do? The antecedent point is removing that child from the school before the um, fire alarm goes off. That's the antecedent. That's giving the situation a solution to not cause a behavior. All right? Now, my dog might bark, sorry. Um, if you have to have a de-escalation plan and that student has to hear that darn, you know, alarm, then the de-escalation plan is what's going to be put in place step by step to de-escalate that child and whatever it is that happens when that alarm goes off. All right. So let's just take, you know, if your child is um, at home. All right. And they are escalated as this child was by a certain subject. All right. And you know that that subject is just a, a signal. All right. That that's going to set them off. All right then that is when movement breaks can go into play. That is when chunking of work can go into play of what is, is being requested of them, all right? Um, I'm big on if some sort of academic instruction is setting them off, which is going to create a negative outlook, then something needs to go in place to change that thought process. So a solution that I always give in regard to an academic issue, so an academic area, math, science, reading, sci writing, whatever, okay, then in that area, they need to have direct one-on-one -on -one instruction, all right? That's going to eliminate the behavior typically. Um, it's not going to eliminate escape from starting, but it's going to eliminate the behavior of setting them off and flipping them out or whatever it is they do because they don't like that behavior, because major escape issues are happening with this child who doesn't want to write in, you know, in certain areas, okay? So giving you an example, um, in that area, you, in, with special needs, I always say, dependent on their, their impact of disability, I always say, don't give my child homework, okay? We're not creating any more frustration, all right? So that's something you can ask for as an accommodation. Another thing is I love organizational binders, depending on their age. In the school, you can do desk organization systems, so they're not looking for things for five, ten minutes to get organized and start the assignment late. All right. Um, again, big on one-on-one -on -one instruction in areas of difficulty. 
all right? So not only because it's a writing issue with this student, not only does he need OT to improve that area because the frustration's there because there's a deficit there, all right? But uh, so that's a link, all right? You got to link things, all right? The link is, the dog's going to bark. Rocco, come here. Come here, Rocco. So the link is, all right, here's a deficit. What do I need to do to resolve the deficit? All right, the deficit is then OT working on writing skills so that the writing skills don't create enhanced sensory issues, enhanced behavior issues, enhanced frustration. That's just going to be a big cluster, all right, and just going to cause problems across the board. All right, um, another thing is in that area of difficulty, all right, so we're speaking of an area that increases your child's behavior based on the fact that... Um, they're not wanting to do certain subjects, all right? And they're like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm going to go jump on the bed instead. I'm going to go hit Sarah across the way. I'm going to go run out of the room. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, that's an escape behavior. Escape, you know, thinking escape. You can't, you can think of escape as escape is moving away from something you don't want to do, all right? Escape isn't always running out the door and saying, see you later, I'm out. Um, escape is just trying to get away from any one thing. OK, um, another thing that I'm big on um, that should go into a de-escalation plan is figuring out if ignoring the behavior decreases the behavior. All right. So you want to figure out if ignoring it decreases it or does it enhance it? Because it's a it's a it's a it becomes an issue of that child wanting attention. All right. So they're frustrated. So they need your attention to say, OK, hey, Johnny. Let's calm down. Let's work this out. You know, here, mom's going to help you. So in virtual, all right, mom's going to help you. Let me write out the letter so you can trace it, depending on their age. You know, you just figure out what you can do to help implement and be that one-on-one, -on -one, all right? And unfortunately, you're not the teacher. Is it your responsibility? Nope. But we're parents, and that's what we do. So, hi, how are you guys? All right, so the other thing I want you to know is um, redirection helps some, not always. Um, I'm really big on positive attention for positive behavior. Ignore the negative. All right. So, and that worked for Skylar, but again, it does, uh, you got to think of all scenarios because all children are different. All right. If I would ignore the negative behavior, but give a ton of positive behavior and sometimes, you know, the little trinket toys she likes or whatever for the good behavior, then she learned, huh, if I don't do this and I do this five times because she has a token system, which is the next thing I was going to say, figure out what truly enhances them to want to do something, motivates them, so to speak. All right. Figure out what that is. You don't always want it to be some expensive gift because no one wants to sit and pay for things all the time. So if it can be positive enforcement and big positive enforcement, like you're, <laughs> I always say people are like dogs. Sounds bad, I know, but it's true. You train them the same. Um, so <laughs> it sounds funny and sounds bad at the same time. Okay, so, you know, when you're training a dog, all right, don't take this offensively, all right? Just don't. If you want to take it offensively, then you're not thinking right, okay? Just get off the page and go because this is so true. I cannot even tell you how true this is, all right? When you're training a dog, what do you say? You want to say sit, and then they sit, and you give them a treat, right? Same freaking thing, all right? So you're, you'd want your child to do what you want them to do in the right time. And when they do it, you're like, yay, that is so awesome. I'm so glad you do that. Good job. Look, my dog's looking at me right now, right? Because he's like, oh, mom, are you talking to me? You know, because he's, he's engaging in the fact that I'm saying, good job. That was a good job. I'm so happy. That is so awesome. Good job. Look, he's right here. Look, I'm not kidding. What? <laughs> um, because I'm like making a big deal. Like, oh my gosh, you did such a good job, Skylar. Give me a high five. That was awesome. All right. So then, you know, that motivates them. Okay. I want to do that again because I want that excitement. And when I say positive reinforcement, I don't mean good job. That's awesome. Yay. Oh, look, look at my dog right here. All right. Look, <laughs> he's like, mom's excited, you know? So it's go. Um, so it's so true how much positive reinforcement, we all love positive reinforcement, but you know, positive reinforcement, and I mean that big positive reinforcement of that is, oh, 
<laughs> with your partners too. You are so freaking right, girl. Um, uh, it's interesting how that is so impactful, okay? Does it work for everything? No, all right? But it works for a lot, all right? And you just got to figure out what it is that's going to motivate, all right? And sometimes when, you know, Skylar wants to please me so much that if I'm excited like that, I mean, she gets so excited. She'll even stim for a second because she's so excited. And she'll say, I did a good job. I, you know, she knows, you know. But if she does a bad job, I don't say, that sucked. That was bad. Why would you do that? That is horrible. Um, or you being a bad girl. I'm like, actually, not cool with that. I did that with my first child, which was a learning experience. And then I became like, I don't say that anymore. I'm not saying you're a bad parent if you do that. We all say stupid shit. But when you say someone's bad, it's like, well, what does bad mean? You know, because your interpretation of bad and my interpretation of bad could be different, right? So my thing is you don't really want to tell somebody, hey, you're bad, you know, because I would say, screw you, you know, and kids get to the point where they say that too. So my thing is, is you want to say, hey, I really didn't like it when you did that. Or we don't, that's a big thing that I do. We don't do that. We don't do that here. That is not okay. All right, because I'm big on there has to be a consequence. And that's a consequence. What I just did is we do not do that here. That will not happen. All right, they need to know, just like you do with a dog or your husband. All right, hey, I mean business. This ain't happening. All right, and you know, behaviors are controllable. All right, I can't tell you how many parents I talk to that are like, my kid does this in school, but they don't do it at home. All right. Um, because we have a little bit more sometimes control over what it is we're going to do. But I will say on the school side at home, structure is not so much there as much as at school. All right. So going back to how I was going to say and how my topic said, the teacher's just bad. The teachers just don't know anything and they're not doing their job because they're not enforcing proper accommodations and, you know, saying to a BCBA, hey, you need to do an FBA. This child is not doing well in my class. You need to, you know, hey, we need to have an IEP meeting. These are the accommodations that need to be put in play. Does that need to happen a little bit more? Yes. But what I said in this IEP meeting, all right, because this girl, this teacher, she reminded me of my daughter. She was extremely young. You could tell that she just recently graduated. And we do not want to, and even as an advocate, we do not want to deter teachers that young who don't know everything, all right? I don't want to say any better because that sounds childish, but it's don't know everything because we don't, no one knows everything, but we definitely don't know everything just starting a job, right? So, but the cool thing about young teachers is they know all the new shit, y'all. All right. So sometimes when you get an old set in their ways, no offense, but it's true. When you get the old set in their ways, that can suck. All right. Or you can get an old set in their ways and they know a lot and are helping. All right. So you, you get all kinds of different scenarios and you guys know I'm right. OK. All right. You got the teacher that's been teaching and I mean old as in they've been teaching 20 years or whatever. All right. So you got your old teacher who's been teaching 20 years who knows her shit and is is very successful at what she does or he does. Or you have your 20 year teacher who is set in their ways and it doesn't work for many kids with special needs because they're so set in their way. Uh -uh. You got to be flexible with children with special needs. Shoot, you got to be flexible with me because I, I, I'm not, I'm, you're not going to put me in a basket. I'm definitely not one, you know, to, to blend. I, I stand out. So if you, if you want someone to blend, that's not going to be a special needs child and it's not going to be me and it's not going to be a lot of people in this world. All right. No one just wants to be put in a box. All right. And ch -ch 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 -ch, that's how you have to act. All right. You have to give kids the freedom to be frustrated. You have to give kids the freedom to have feelings. You have to give kids the freedom to express themselves in a way that is normal, so to speak, if I don't like that word, but is normal, so to speak, to the typical, to you and I. All right. Because think about it. Have you ever Okay, give me a thumbs up. All right, own it. Have you ever gotten mad and and yelled or screamed? 
I have. Hands up. Come on, let me see. Okay? Have you ever gotten mad and screamed or yelled at your child, your husband, whomever? I have. Okay? And what happens? All right? It's typically not productive. <laughs> Does it solve anything? No, not normally. But bottom line, what I'm trying to get at is... We don't have special needs, but we still get angry. We scream. Does that make us bad people? No. It means we got mad and frustrated and we reacted. All right. The goal, though, is to teach our children how to, in a healthy way, not just our children, okay? That's what I'm saying here is, is behaviors across the board, okay? See? Many of us have to learn healthy ways in which to change a behavior that's negative. All right? So I've tried to really be mindful, unless I'm real pissed. All right? Um, you know I'm pissed if I scream and yell now. Where I used to scream and yell in my 20s all the time. All right? So my oldest got the brunt of my craziness. And then I had my son at 27, or no, I had my son at 23. So he got a little bit of craziness, not so much as Elena. I had Elena at 19. And then I had Justin at 23 and Skylar at 27. And so, you know, Elena got the brunt of everything. She's my teacher. And then Justin, he did not get as much and he was spoiled freaking rotten because he was my only boy. I know, bad thing, but he was. And then you have Skylar, who's the baby. All right. She's really not a baby. She's 15, but she's still the baby. All right. Don't call her a baby or she will flip out. I am not a baby. I am a big girl. Do not call me a baby. Another thing that will make her flip out if you say, uh-uh. I don't know why that pisses her off. I'll do it in front of you guys sometime and let you see her reaction. I know, look, I'm going to trigger her, but I want you to see her reaction. She immediately says, do not tell me, uh-uh. That's rude. Or she'll say, don't tell me, uh-uh. I don't like it. So do you see what she did? is I say, uh-uh, and she doesn't like that. For some reason, uh-uh, instead of no or yes or whatever, triggers her. Just saying, uh-uh. That simple thing triggered her. So I know you guys have children that probably little stupid things like that trigger them. But you know what? Who are we to judge it? It pisses her off. It pisses her off. I can't change it. It pisses her off. All right? So if I say, uh-uh, and I say it a lot, it pisses her off. So she says, don't tell me, uh-uh. And I'll say... Because I'm in the process of teaching her, hey, you can't tell people what to say. You don't have to like it, but you can't tell people what to say. All right? So this morning I said, uh-uh. What did she do? Mom, I don't like uh-uh. Don't tell me uh-uh. And I'll say, Sky, don't tell me what to say. All right? It, it is what it is. Mom says uh-uh, and sometimes I just say it. doesn't mean anything. Uh-uh means <laughs> no, or I don't think so, or whatever, you know? And um, so I'm teaching her a way to think about it differently. And, and, and when she's doing that, thinking about it differently, she's not thinking about it pissing her off. You see what I'm saying? So when you give kids options of if they're getting simulated and things are going on, and you give them, Rocco, and you give them other options on how to handle that situation, that is more positive, like for you and I. Look, everybody said, you know, hey, I've screamed and yelled, right? So I've had to check myself, all right? I've had to, like, take a deep breath, like we teach our kids, right? Um, I've had to, you know, shut my eyes and focus on something else. I've had to, you know, just walk out of the room. Whatever the case may be, I try not to scream and yell. Why? Because it's not productive. It's never gotten me anywhere. And if I do yell, though, now... It does get something done. Why? Because I don't do it all the time. When you do something all the time like that, people tune it out. All right? So when we do things seldomly and then all of a sudden we start yelling or something's going on, then what happens? That person takes us seriously. All right? That person then is, their ears are perked up because they're like, whoa, why is she yelling? She doesn't yell, you know? Because they know you mean business at that time. Same thing with the IEP. Think about that, right? Um, they're used to, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of my parents are come at them very nicely. They don't know how to approach things. So they're like kind of 
on this iffy limbo of how they approach it. And I've seen emails from parents and they're very sweet and kind and whatever. And mine are nothing like that. All right. So it's nothing against them. It's not personal. But mine just aren't like that, you know, um, because I mean business. All right. When I come into play, I mean business. Things change. Bam. All right. It, it goes from sweet to direct and to the point. So it comes across as direct and to the point. I would say very assertive slash maybe a little bit aggressive, um, but it gets a response, all right? And that response then starts producing things. Does it always? No, there's a couple that hasn't, and then I've had to take it to other measures. But bottom line, typically it gets a response and gains a response, all right? Because why? They're not used to that, and then bam, Raven comes into the picture, and holy hell, right? Same thing with kids, all right? You handle things, you give them a pillow, you give them different words to use, you put accommodations in place to chunk out, you know, chunking means split up the, the project, split up the work. So, you know, if say, you know, they have 20 things to do, 20, 20 problems, all right, you chunk it up and maybe twos, threes, fours, whatever, and then they get those 20 problems done, four, four, you know, um, and then it's chunked up and after each four, give them like a two minute break. Then they do another four, two minute break. So what are they doing? They're doing a negative because they don't like it. The negative is doing the four problems. Then they get a positive, two minute break. Play on the iPad for two minutes, whatever. Then they get four, four more problems, two minute break. So whatever the reward is, Sky's reward um, was a lot of times an iPad, you know? Um, and then you wanna pick times. I am not a fan of the walk around, um, you know, what is it? Like walking around and taking a break, walking in the hallway. Now, does that need to happen sometimes? Yes. Okay. But I'm not a fan of it. And I'll tell you why. All right. Because there's other options to put into play first. All right. But do some kids need to walk out of the room and walk around the hallway for five minutes and come back in? Yes. Okay. What I don't want is our children are smart, all right? So even if your child's nonverbal, I don't care. They're smart. They will figure out, hey, if I go and rip up this paper, all right? I have a child that this is what he does. <laughs> it's funny. I've seen him do it. And then he throws it. That, that's what he does. I literally saw him do it, all right, on the Zoom with the parent. <laughs> And I started laughing. I shouldn't have laughed, but it was funny as hell because he was like, screw this. I'm not doing this work. Um, and I didn't blame him. All right. But then what I said to mom, I was like, you know what? I said, I bet you that, you know, because what he wanted to do is he wanted to go in his room and play Xbox. And this is a child that was verbal. All right. I want to go play Xbox. I don't want to do this work, you know, and mom let him play Xbox. Um, and so I said, you know what? Tell them, say, you know what, you do five minutes of work, you do five minutes of uh, Xbox, five minutes of work, five minutes of Xbox, and then fade it, all right? So then it's 10 minutes of work, five minutes of Xbox, all right? Then it's 15 minutes of work and five minutes of Xbox, all right? You know, so you're kind of going back and forth and you're figuring out, okay, what works, all right? If that doesn't work, then you come up with something else, all right? But what you don't want is that child using the behavior to get the reward, Okay, so Skylar, all right, got really smart at the fact that if she, because they taught her how to say, because she would get frustrated and then self-inflicting behaviors would happen or she'd scream or she'd cuss. All right, she's a cusser because her mother's a cusser, but no, she learned cuss words from her two older siblings. All right, it really wasn't from me, for real, even though I am a cusser. Um, all right, I, I was have military background and, you know, <laughs> um, was I feel like I was married to the military. Um, and you know, I, I have a mouth. So anyway, long story short, um, Skylar had a mouth. Okay. And, um, you know, I told you guys, she used to say, shut the fuck up. She still says it sometimes, but she has learned. And that was taught to her from her brother. And she says it at the right time. It is funny. It is still funny. Okay, it cracks me the hell up. It really does. Because it's not just she just randomly says shut the fuck up. Oh, no, it's when you say something to her, she doesn't like and she will tell you straight up. All right. So we taught her how to say shut the front door as a positive. 
All right. So now she's 15. She gets when she says shut the fuck up. She knows when she does it. She is very aware. And she actually stops herself mid-sentence now, which shows me she's understanding and processing of, I shouldn't say that. Look, see, I was going to say, oh, shit. See, I'm a cusser too. Um, so now she'll say, shut the, shut the front door. And then she'll say it again because she has to say the whole sentence. And so I'll say to her, good job, Sky. You almost lost your phone. So what did I do? I said, good job on the edge because she can feel that now. Now a little kid may be good job. I'm so proud of you, you know, and you stop there. All right. Where she's older now. So it was good job, Sky. You almost lost your phone. So what I'm doing is saying, okay, you did a good job. You used the tool given to you, which should be in the BIP guys. What is going to be given to them as a replacement behavior? You always have to replace that negative behavior. And this is the problem in schools, all right? You cannot have a BIP without a de-escalation plan for every single one of those behaviors. That's number one. Number two, okay, you cannot have a BIP without a positive replacement for the negative behavior. What the hell is the point? of a BIP with a de-escalation plan and no positive strategies given to teach that child positive ways in which to handle the behavior. Completely pointless. You have to have a de-escalation plan so if things get tough, you got a plan. And then suspensions don't happen. Then, you know, in-school suspension, whatever the hell they do these days, all right? Um, then you have an argument if they ever suspend your child and you have a de-escalation plan in place, you got one hell of an argument there. You got me? Also, if you have a BIP, you always, always have to have a positive behavior that's taught to the child to replace that behavior. One or more. Okay? You cannot just have one behavior to replace it. Like the child hits, you say hit a pillow. Or hits themselves, hit a pillow. It can't just be the damn pillow. They may not like hitting the pillow. All right? So you need to figure out what they're going to want to do to replace that hitting somebody or themselves that's healthy. If it's not going to hurt somebody or some or themselves, all right, or disrupt the classroom in some way, shape, or form and impede their learning or somebody else's learning, that's a big one, all right? then it's positive, all right? I don't care if they have a balloon to punch. I don't care. Whatever it is that child wants to punch that's not going to hurt them or someone else or disrupt the room, all right, but they got to get out that aggression somehow, some way, then it could be walking around the school for two minutes, three minutes, you know? But you don't want to exceed the time to where it's extensive in a way that is really going to impede their learning because you're taking so much time focusing on the negative behavior and the reward that's given to them because of it. Okay? So you want to, or to, to, to deflect it, I should say. All right? So they had a negative behavior. So what is part of the de, de you have a de-escalation plan? So, okay, we're taking a walk in the hallway. You don't want that going back and forth all the time because then you're playing ping pong. All right, that's ping pong. Behavior, okay, let's go take a walk. Behavior, punch a pillow. Behavior, shut the front door. You know what I mean? You want to eliminate the behavior. You want to fade the behavior. You want to figure out a way to replace the behavior with positive strategies that work. And if they don't work, change them up. And that's what the school needs to be responsible for. And you, as the parent, can give suggestions of what works at home. All right, because if it works at home, it needs it will work at school. They just have to implement it. And so that's part of being an adequate team member and, and a team. All right. And so you need to make sure that that's focused on. All right, guys. So another thing I want to just make sure that I hit on is modified assignments can create less frustration, but you don't want to eliminate assignments to remove education. All right. So if the child has to do 20 problems and that's an extreme frustration to them, not an extreme frustration to them to where they're just having behaviors because they don't want to do it. I mean, it's too much. 
and you know it's too much at that time. That doesn't mean you get to tw don't get to 20. That doesn't mean you don't accomplish that. That doesn't mean that's not a goal. It just means that 20 is too much. It, it throws them off and, and life goes downhill after that. So that means, okay, let's go to 15. You know, lower and put in a modification there. All right. Um, another thing is um, for focus, working memory, visual memory issues, okay, executive functioning, those types of things, you want to focus on gaining that child's attention before a direction or instruction is given, all right? So when I say, okay, hey, hey, Aaron, so I'm just going to use Aaron's name, Aaron, hey, how are you? Um, then I have Aaron's attention. All right. She's looking at me because I said, hey, how are you? You know, or however you want to approach it. All right. Or I say, Michelle, Michelle, hey, how are you? You know, how are you doing? Have a conversation. You know, how are you doing? What did you do this morning? You know, did you brush your teeth this morning? What did you have for breakfast? Tell me what you had for breakfast. Because when people start engaging with you and responding to you, what happens? They're engaged. They're focused. They're ready to get going. All right, but you had a positive conversation and then now it's time to get back to work. We're going to or or get to work for the in the first place. All right. So sometimes children need that that transition of play at home, just woke up, just had breakfast to bam on the computer to get off the bus. Bam, school's. You know, they're in a classroom and they're in school and they're putting their backpack up and they have to learn all this crap. Like, I know that was part of goals, you know, in kindergarten, first grade for Siler and second grade. Okay, she had to learn how to take everything out of her backpack. She had to learn how to leave her lunch in her backpack. She had to learn how to take out her pencil. She had to learn how all that tedious stuff, right? Go to her desk, put stuff in her desk, you know, all these things. Sometimes it's just too much, you know? And sometimes, is that important? Is that part of daily living? No, it's not. Someone else do it. Let the child go sit at the desk. All right? Eliminate it all together. Oh, no. And the teacher is saying, no, 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 no. They need to learn how to put their stuff away. And da, da, da. Yeah, they do. But right now, it's not working and it's causing behavior. So we're going to eliminate the behavior and we're going we're gonna to wait for another three months and then we'll try it again. Okay? So there's times where you have to say that. We're going to eliminate that. We're going to take away the problem altogether because it's, it's stimulating issues. It's causing transition issues. Children with autism, children with ADHD especially too, you know, there's that correlation between autism and ADHD. And a lot of people get confused, you know, because, you know, autism, a lot of children with autism have ADHD. Um, a lot of children with autism have something else. Like Skylar has autism and dyslexia. Um, a lot of children, you know, it, it's very rare, believe it or not, even if your child was recently diagnosed, it's very rare for your child to just have autism. I'm not saying it never happens, okay? I'm saying it's very rare, and it is. Go look it up. Typically, they will have something else, and it's not something huge. It's not always something huge. It's not anything like that. I'm just saying typically they'll have something else. It could be autism and enhanced sensory-based issues. Because sometimes the autism itself isn't always what's causing, causing the enhanced sensory issues. It could be something else, okay? Um, and that something else stems from whatever the disability is, all right? Um, and it could stem from autism, yes. A lot of people say, okay, autism, sensory issues, autism, sensory issues. But it's not always together. Sometimes it's something else. All right. Just like I didn't realize for years that Skylar had dyslexia. I did not correlate the fact that she was having trouble with comprehension and fluency and focus and decoding and all these things. <laughs> Rocco, Rocco. And I wasn't understanding the fact that she was also having trouble with math and the two typically go together. Not always, sometimes. Now let's get back to teachers. All right. So in this meeting, the young teacher reminded me a lot of my daughter and she was super young. And she was super sweet and she didn't talk much. You know, you could tell that she was just kind of new to this whole IEP thing. And, um, but mom said she engaged. She taught. The student, the child, liked the teacher. That is key. If a child likes his teacher, everything else can be fixed. All right? I, trust me. Unless the teacher is just a dingbat. So, what I'm saying is if your child likes their teacher, everything else can be fixed. 
Again, unless they're just a dingbat, all right, which typically teachers are not, all right. So bottom line, I said to the teacher, how many children do you have in your class? And this is online. This is California, as I was dealing with. And she said 28. And so I turned straight up to mom and I said, there is no way that she can redirect, call on your child and, you know, make sure that he's staying on task virtually with 28 other students. Not happening. Not happening. So you can ask for whatever you want, but I didn't say all that. But I'm telling you guys, you can ask for whatever you want. But if a teacher has 28 students, she's teaching virtually. And you're saying, well, I want this accommodation, 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 and you're requesting that of the teacher, you're out of your ever-loving mind. I'm telling you straight up right now. Think about it. Why would you ask something of a teacher that you couldn't do yourself? Think about that for a second. Why would you ask something of a teacher that you can't do yourself? I can't, Raven, I can't teach 28 students and focus on your child individually and give them one-on-one -on -one attention, redirect them, and always call on them because they're Rocco. No, sir. No, sir. Um, and redirect them because they're having behavior issues Focus on the behavior issues and redirect them because of the behavior issue and teach 28 other students and then progress. Not happening. What's the solution to that, guys? What's the solution to that? I'll give you the solution. To that. Rocco, you want to go to your bed? Look, he knows exactly what that means. See, that's the consequence to his parking. <laughs> um, all right, so here's the solution, guys. So the solution I gave was, number one, the child needs a damn one-on-one, -on -one, virtually. Because that one-on-one, -on -one, and this is how that's gonna look. I'm a solution thought person. Does that even make sense? I think of the solution, I don't think of the problem within itself. Does that make sense? That child needs a damn one-on-one, -on -one, all right? Even virtually, is it gonna work perfectly virtually? Is it gonna work virtually always? Hmm. Maybe not, because they're not physically there, all right? But bottom line, that one-on-one -on -one needs to park their butt in the school setting, which is virtual, all right, in the computer, whatever, all right? And when it can be non-disruptive to the teacher, they then ask the student that they're the one-on-one -on -one for questions or whatnot because there's things there's times where the kids are working on things and that's when you know they can say hey Steven I just wanted to make sure are you doing are you doing your work did you write it down you know and get this is those directions those simple simplistic directions of step by step write your name put a number one write this what the teacher said in writing etc and step by step guess what Hopefully the kids too. no sir I might have to get up in a second to shut my window, but it may and can help other students, okay? Believe it or not, accommodations help everybody. Accommodations are awesome. They help everybody. They don't just help one person or your child with disabilities, all right? So it's actually a positive thing. But bottom line, you can't put it all on the teacher. It, it ain't her job, y'all. It ain't. It's not her job to just teach your child. It's her job to teach all those 28 students, which your child was in that t number of 28. All right. What is the school's job is to make sure your child has all the services, accommodations, and modifications that they need in place so the damn teacher can teach. And your child learns and everybody else learns. That's the problem in the system. Not that your teacher's shit because they're not always shit. Most of the time, they're not shit, all right? I'm just going to keep it real. There are some teachers that are shit, okay? I will just call that out. But most are not, okay? Most are great. And most have a lot put on their plate. And most um, are just trying to make it work, you know? Because right now, this is a time where, shoot, I would be lost. If I was teaching, I would be so lost. My daughter is going crazy, 
she teaches 10th grade English and she has so much on her plate. And guess what? She doesn't get paid enough for that. I'm telling you right now. I've told her, you do not get paid enough for this because I'm her mother. I'm going to talk to her like her mother. I'm not going to talk to her like we need better teachers because we do. We need teachers like her. We need teachers like that teacher that I saw today that's young and fresh and has all the new things and is open to suggestions and will do it. She did it. She implemented working with this child, giving him more attention than the other kids, which in my opinion is not fair. And I will fight for that. I'm not just going to fight for a child with special needs. I'm going to fight for other children as well because they deserve the same time and attention. All right. And what needs to happen is our kids, okay, need to have what is proper and needed in place so that they can all learn together and that the teacher can teach and everything's in play. All right. And then it's smooth. All right. Not always, but you know what I'm saying. All right, so that was what was suggested by me today. Proper BIP in place, proper de-escalation plans in place in regards to every single behavior, all right? Proper accommodations in place in which to support that student, direct instruction in regards to the deficit areas and areas that cause enhanced frustration, and um, figuring out the reward system, all right? All right, instead of thinking negativity, negativity, consequence, 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 focus on the, the, the reward. All right, what can I do to motivate this child to do what I want him to do or her to do to then get this? And then you do it again. I want her to do four math problems, then she gets a five-minute break on the iPad. Four more math problems five-minute break on the iPad. And what's happening? That child is learning. If I do what I'm supposed to do, then I get this, all right? In their brains, it's a reward. In our brains, it's a, my child is getting the work done, all right? But that reward isn't extensive. It's a five-minute on the iPad. It's a, okay, you can, you know, go to the back of the room to your special place and sit on your beanbag chair for five minutes. I don't care what the reward is. Whatever it is that motivates them. That's what is the hardest thing to figure out sometimes is what is it that motivates your child enough to get them to do the work or to get them to do what's frustrating them the most. All right. So now I'm going to tell you. So in regards to teachers, give them a break, guys. Figure out what needs to go into play to solve the problem don't put it all on the teacher. Just like the school needs to not put it all on the parent who's working at home with their child because they're not the teacher. They're not the expert. We're just parents. All right. So the school needs to not put it on the parents to be the, the person that does X, Y, Z. And the school um, needs to, and when the child's in school, the, you know, the things need to be put in place in regards to a one-on-one -on -one and the ability to redirect, the ability to you know, put different things in play, the ability to give the rewards, the ability to do the consequences, and that one-on-one -on -one better be so fluent in that child's IEP and BIP that they can, they can tell you what it means with their eyes closed, okay? Um, that is important. All right, so here's a violation they did that I'm not sure how I'm going to address, all right? And I caught this. I caught this pretty quick. All right. And it's going to get loud, guys, because my husband's home and everything's coming into play and I've talked over an hour. So just hear me out. The, the, guys, come on. My dogs are barking because my husband's home and they want to fight it. Who goes to the door for it? Okay, behaviors. Um, Rocco, no, sir. Rocco, go to your bed. Go, just go to your bed. Go. Go to your bed if you're going to bark. All right, real quick, guys, real quick, and then I'm going to jump off here. All right, so here is what happened. The, the psychologist is also a BCBA. She said, these are her words, um, over nine days is what the, when the FBA took place and the dates were put on the FBA, all right? And then she said, I did five days. The RBT, which is a res registered behavior technician, so it goes BCBA, BCABA, RBT. All right, RBT is a certified, they take a certification, they just have, a, have to have a diploma, and they can take a certification um, 
course, which is an extensive course, and RBT is decent, all right, and and, and doing ABA therapy under the supervision of a BCBA. Um, so they're fine, but they're not qualified to do an evaluation, all right, or an FBA, which is an evaluation. So the psychologist slash BCBA said, hey, I did a FBA in nine days. In those nine days, I personally did five. The RBT did four. So I said, whoa, whoa, whoa can I, un- I need to understand something. So you only did five of the, the nine days of the evaluation, so the other four were done by the RBT, and we were recording. So that's why I repeated what I wanted to understand. Sorry about the toys, <laughs> um, the dog toys. Um, so she said, yes. So I said, you do realize that's a violation, right? And they said, well, let's move on. No. I just want to make sure you understand that's a violation, right? Make sure whoever does your child's evaluations is the qualified person. I'll tell you how it's a a violation. An RBT is not qualified or trained to do any type of evaluation. Not an FBA, not anything. They're trained to implement. They're trained to implement under the the observation and um, supervision of the trained individual. All right? Same thing with a one-on-one, guys. All right? They're trained to implement. They are not trained to teach. They are not trained to do any of that. They are trained to implement, okay, to support. The teacher taught reading. The one-on-one then supports the reading and, and on keeps the education going, if you will, okay? Um, they are not teaching the reading. They are continuing the reading that was taught. All right, so that's just a tip for you guys. So I'm done with my talk for an hour and 11 minutes and 30 seconds. I will say hi to all you guys later, but I don't want you guys to hear the dogs go crazy. They're playing with their darn toys. I figured I'd go in the living room and go live, but now it's kind of getting crazy in my household. Skylar's going to be home. What are you guys doing this weekend? You'll have to post below what you're doing this weekend. Um, But give your teachers a break. Understand that it's not always the teacher, okay? It, It needs to be where accommodations, BIPs, and everything else is in play so that your child's life is made easier, this teacher's life is made easier, and you have a a created plan of action that can hopefully go smooth. If it doesn't work, you change it up. But then it's not driving your child batshit crazy, and it's not driving the teacher batshit crazy. Because if the teacher's going batshit crazy, I'm going to tell y'all, if the teacher's going batshit crazy, she's not going to teach, well, anybody. All right, if I'm going batshit crazy, you ain't going to get the best raven. You ain't going to get me focused. All right, so same thing with our kids, same thing with us, same thing with the teachers. All right, have a wonderful, wonderful, here, I got to move this thing. Have a wonderful night. Have an awesome weekend. I love you guys. Post below if you're joining live. One, if you are new, first through third time joining live. All right, post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie. All right, make sure you say hi. And everybody that made comments, I'm going to go back and and get to your comments while I'm watching a movie tonight. Friday night is our family night. We do pizza and movie. Um, And then um, I want you guys to also know that um, I'm going to be on live later on this, you know, after the weekend. Um, I usually go live on Sunday with a tip of the week. Um, So catch me then. I'll probably um, have some coffee with my group members tomorrow. Um, So if you haven't joined the group, just go to search Autism Mom Rocks IEP group and join the group. And I will see you guys soon. Have a wonderful weekend.